Hi everybody and welcome to today's training module on supporting LGBTIQA plus autistic young people. I'm going to start off with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm living on Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations peoples here with us today. A little bit about me. My name is Sam, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm 26 years old. I was raised or socialized as a girl, but I knew that I was transgender from a very young age. I just didn't quite have the language or the advocacy skills to speak up. I was diagnosed as autistic at age 20 young, uh, 21. Uh, I was diagnosed after struggling to manage my mental health during the transition to university and moving interstate for this. And I received an autism diagnosis about a year into that journey. I came out as transgender at age 22. And after trying out a couple of different labels and pronouns, I've now settled on non-binary and they, them for now, um, but I'm pretty happy with where I'm at understanding more about my gender and autistic identity has helped me in all different facets of my life. I'm going to be speaking about my experiences working as a program facilitator for autistic LGBTIQA plus young people. And I'm also going to be speaking to responses from a survey and youth consultation that we've conducted for this resource development. One of the threads that I'm really hoping will get we've woven into the presentation today is just to wrap a sense of safety and understanding and trust around autistic LGBTIQA plus young people. It's really important that the adults in our lives have a better understanding of what young people are going through and what different experiences might look or be like. This is how we can help the world to be more safe and accepting. And this is how we can accommodate for these differences and let people know that it's okay to express yourself in this way. So what does LGBTIQA plus autistic identity look like? First up, I'm gonna talk about what is autism. So some of the feedback that we received during the consultations and surveys was that a lot of LGBTIQA plus young people said that they felt as though service providers or the grown-ups in their lives didn't have a thorough understanding of what autism was, or especially they didn't have a positive understanding about what autism is. Um, so often a lot of rhetoric that was existing in the past was very deficit and disorder based. But what we really understand is that autistic people don't have deficits or disorders. It's just a different processing style. Our brains are wired differently and it's a different type of interpreting the world and expressing it out to the world. Autistic people process the world differently. And we can kind of see that through things like sensory differences, communication differences, or strong interests or autistic passions. I'm gonna talk a little bit about sensory differences now. So on the left-hand column, you can see we've got the kind of classic five, taste, touch, smell, sight, and sound. And on the right-hand side, I've got vestibular, which is our sense of balance. Proprioceptive, which is our sense of our limbs in space. So for example, when I'm typing at my laptop and I don't need to look at the keyboard, this is because my proprioceptive sense is helping me to know where my fingers are and know which keys they're sitting over. Another sense is interoception, and this is our sense of hunger or thirst. It's our sense of internal, what's going on inside us. Uh, it's also related to needing to go to the toilet. And I think it's also related to our feelings and our emotions and how we pick up on those and how we read those. There are plenty more senses, for example, a sense of time, a sense of temperature, a sense of um, pain is different to our sense of touch. What we find is that autistic people generally have a bunch of sensory differences. So our threshold for how we can pick up on this sense, how our brain process it, press, processes it, is gonna be different for autistic people compared to non-autistic people. 
for example, someone might have a really low sensory threshold when it comes to sight or vision. This means that lights may be perceived as brighter than people without a low threshold. So this is why things like supermarkets and shopping centres can be really overwhelming for some autistic people. This is because the lights might be too loud, especially if they're fluorescent. They can tend to have a bit of a buzz that non-autistic people might not pick up on. And they have this kind of flash and it can be really hard to filter this out. And it can be really hard to focus on the task at hand, which is getting the groceries. Other people might have a really high sensory threshold. So this means it can be really hard to have this sense or to experience this sense. An example that I will use is that I love football. Uh, I think that I have a pretty high sensory threshold when it comes to proprioception and vestibular. Uh, and maybe this also ties into a sense of touch. I love tackling people. Um, and I love the kind of intensity of football and being able to run around and jump up in the sky to mark the ball. I think that this is a really healthy activity that helps me to fulfill that sense. And I think that it ties into having high sensory thresholds. So if I don't do these things and I start to get restless and I don't quite feel like I can relax into my body, um, but having that sense used and having that sense activated is really, really healthy for my own sense of well-being and my sense of restlessness. So there are many other examples of this. I'm going to leave it at the moment at this, but I just think it's really important to recognise that all autistic people, I mean, every single person will have a different sensory profile, but autistic people in particular will have a bit of a spiky profile, so it might not be consistent. Um, some people might have a really low threshold for one sense or a really high threshold for another sense. And that's going to dictate how we manage our environments, what environments we like to be in, and how we can pay attention and how we can focus. Next up, I'm going to talk a little bit about communication differences. So an autistic person uses and is tuned into different forms of communication. And I think this is another really important aspect of being autistic. We have different communication styles. We have different communication preferences. So often uh, spoken or written language seems to be the dominant way that we communicate or expect people to communicate in Western culture. There are a couple of other main, language, uh, main ways of uh, communicating. Sign language is one. And other people might prefer to communicate through things like body language and tone. Uh, we know that everyone has different patterns of communication and different, um, I guess, places where our attention is drawn towards. So someone might prioritise someone's tone of language rather than the actual content of what they're saying. Other people might pay attention to someone's body language and use that to get a sense of how someone's feeling or how they're expressing themselves. I think it's also important to point out that there are many other um, artistic ways of communication. So this could be something like through music, um, singing, playing an instrument, being in a band, even listening and sharing music is a form of communication. And another thing is through art. So for example, painting, drawing or sketching, creating sculpture, creating images through other materials and things like digital art or digital drawing. These are all valid ways of communication and these are all really important for self-expression. It's important that we foster that and that we recognise when an autistic person has a different way that they like to articulate themselves. This could be asking someone to create an image or create a picture or share some song, piece of music that they relate to, and then they can communicate around that or they can use that as the prompt to then speak around. Some people might feel uncomfortable just speaking or writing as a standalone thing. Um, and it's also important not to use this as the priority um, and as the main or only form of communication that's accepted. Another couple of differences that you might experience with autistic people, uh, we tend to use echolalia. And that is basically 
copying or repeating words, phrases, sentences, sometimes entire passages um, over and over. And that's how we will communicate. So for example, uh, friends and I, or my brother and sister and I, when we were kids, um, used to watch a lot of Simpsons. And a lot of our conversations were us just quoting Simpson lines back and forth between each other. Um, any situation that was going on, one of us would be able to throw out a Simpsons quote or a Simpsons reference that would be related and would convey some sort of meaning um, related to the situation. This is a really important way of connecting and it's a really fun way of being able to communicate and connect with another person. Another thing that I'm going to mention is info dumping. Uh, this is also quite common for autistic people, which is if you get us onto the topic of something that we find super interesting or something that we're passionate about, uh, we can talk for a very, very long time about this without even taking a break. Uh, I know that I can have got onto these topics at some point. My friends have said that I can do impromptu TED Talks, uh, especially if you ask me the right question at the right time. Um, but it's important to know that this is a really meaningful way that people like to communicate, autistic people, and it's important to respect that. Uh, it's also important to express if you're not in the headspace to be receiving info dumping, uh, it's okay to say that as well. And it's okay to say, can we talk about this at a different time or let's get to that next or maybe let's do it for 10 minutes and then we're going to have to stop and move on. Another thing that's important to recognize is that autistic people can have different affect. So that means the way that we wear our facial expressions, the way that we express ourselves might be different to the way that's expected for non-autistic people. I experience emotions, I assume, similarly to non-autistic people, but I have definitely been told by other people that um, I have more of a flat affect and people are concerned that I'm not happy or I'm not having a good time because my face is flat. Um, that's not how I see things. And I've definitely experienced a lot of people misinterpreting my emotions, misinterpreting my emotional state. Um, and often it can be wildly incorrect and someone will say something and I'll think, oh, that's not true, but I'm not quite sure how to communicate that it's different. Sometimes if I say it, people will think I'm joking and they'll laugh. Uh, so I think it's just important to check in with an autistic person and actually ask what they're thinking about something rather than taking cues um, because they might not be relevant to autistic people. Next up, we're gonna talk about autistic passions. Now, this is really important because not all autistic people, but a lot of autistic people will have a passion and that's going to be how you develop your worldview and how you integrate different aspects of facts of information into your um, how you see the world and into your identity. So often what you'll find is someone might find something super interesting and they want to know everything about it. They want to find out all the information that they can. They'll do deep dives by a Wikipedia or YouTube or jump on the forums and read all of the books and watch all the movies that they can. One thing that I've definitely spoken about with autistic people on a number of occasions is, I guess this explains why autistic people might seem to engage in like repetition. So for example, someone wants to watch the same movie over and over and over again. You finish the movie and you wanna watch it again straight away. The non-autistic rhetoric that seems to surround this is often like, oh, you know, this person, they just like repetition. They just like to think about the same things over and over. Now, sometimes you might want to watch the same movie on repeat because it's comforting, because you're feeling anxious and you need some familiarity and some predictability in your life. And that's important. But conversations that I've had with other autistic people has been, yeah, but every time we watch the movie, it's like you pay attention to something different each time. So every time that you watch it subsequently, you're going to gain an extra layer of understanding or an extra layer of interpretation. Uh, someone used the analogy of, say, you're going for a bushwalk. The first time you walk through it, you pay attention to the leaves on all of the trees. You just spend that walk looking at all the leaves and comparing the different leaf shapes and sizes and colours and how they move in the wind. Then you decide to walk through it again, but this time you look at the tree trunks and you observe how all the different tree trunks differ in their different 
patterns and their shapes and how they move with one another and move with the wind. And you might walk through again and pay attention to the dirt, or you might pay attention to the sky and the clouds behind it, or you might pay attention to the insects and bugs that are all around. So every single time that we're engaging in this thing, it might seem repetitive to another person, but what we could actually be doing is just really in-depthly paying attention to different um, variables or different small aspects of, of this um, idea. And this is how we can build up a really in-depth knowledge and understanding because it actually ties into our worldview and we're connecting these ideas. Uh, and it's hugely motivational. It feels really good. It's really, really exciting. I can almost feel my synapses connecting up when I'm engaging in this kind of passion. Um, I've got a whole bunch of different interests that I engage in and it can really get me going. It can really feel good and re-engage me, especially if I've been feeling disengaged or if I've been feeling a little bit down. Finding a passion or reigniting one of these passions will be a great way to get me out of that slump and to make me feel good. Just a couple of uh, other notes on autism is why do we use uh, autism with a capital A? So basically it just represents that we're a community with a shared identity. Um, the deaf community also does this, we'll use a capital D to symbolize that it's a community to symbolize the shared identity and shared experiences. Um, it also represents that it's a culture. We have a bunch of cultural differences. Next up, uh, do I have autism or am I autistic? I say I am autistic the same way that I say I'm Australian, I am left-handed and I am non-binary. I don't have non-binary, I don't have left-handedness. Uh, I am left-handed because it's part of my identity and it's integrated in with my person. It's not something that I can really step aside. I can't leave it at the door. Uh, it follows me everywhere. <laughs> so, uh, the other thing to note is that autistic identity is just one aspect of our identity. It's one part. Things like gender, class, sexuality, culture, faith, etc. They all make up different parts of our identities. Autism is a neurotype, so it's a type of brain, and our neurotype is just another part of our identity. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of different aspects of our identities. I'll talk about gender identity, I'll talk about sexuality identity, and I'll talk about sex. So what is gender identity? The way that most of us were taught about it at school or growing up, is that you can have Two genders, uh, male or female, boy or girl. Gender identity was linked to sex uh, and there wasn't much of a discussion around it and there wasn't an expectation that this was any more complex than what we'd been told. What we actually find is that this construction of gender is oversimplified and doesn't work for a lot of people especially young people who are coming through equipped with the language and the know-how that there are more ways that you can express your gender identity, that you can experience gender. So this is just a little visual that I've developed to illustrate that there are different ways of thinking about gender. So basically what I've got here is an image of a color wheel, a color spectrum, and on it I have four labels surrounding it. So we have on the left, masculine, and on the right, feminine. And this basically just represents, when I talk about masculine and feminine, I talk about our cultural expectations and the associations that our culture has that is tied to these things. So what are the things that are tied to masculinity? The concepts, the hobbies, the interests, the way of presenting ourselves and characterization. When I talk about these things, it's our cultural expectations. And we know that these ideas differ across cultures and they also differ across time. So at the top, I've got a gender in brackets, a lack of gender. And this basically acknowledges that there are a lot of people who don't identify with the concept of gender, the concept of gender identity. They might feel as though it doesn't play a big part in who they are and how they see themselves and how they interact with the world. And this exists on a bit of a scale as well. So there might be people who feel absolutely no sense of gender, 
other people might have a little bit of a sense of gender, but it won't have such a strong impact on their lives. Other people might identify as gender fluid, and this means you fluctuate between more than one sense of gender. Your gender identity changes, and maybe it changes across a kind of consistent pattern or across a consistent or relatively consistent set of gender identities. So people can sit anywhere on this spectrum, on this color wheel, or they might actually identify with something else entirely. They may sit somewhere else, and that's valid as well. I think that it's just important to recognize that, for example, some people might think of themselves as a little bit masculine, but mostly a gender. And it is kind of important just to be able to distinguish between these different sorts of identities, these different sorts of experiences, because it does tie into how we conduct ourselves across our lives and the expectations that we hold ourselves to and that are put on us. A resource that I find super useful is this genderbred person. You can definitely just find it online by Googling genderbred person. And I think that it just does a really great job of breaking down different aspects of gender identity, gender expression, anatomical sex um, and attraction, breaking it down into sexual and romantic attraction, etc. Now, for this presentation, I've just broken it down a little bit. So it's going to be a bit simplified and it's going to look a little bit like this. So what is gender identity? Essentially, our gender identity is our internal sense of self. It's a concept that we build about ourselves in relation to others. And it's the model or the map that we build up over time uh, about who we are. And gender identity, a lot of it does come from uh, our genes and other parts of it come from our development. It's a combination of all of these things. Um, but I can definitely speak to my own experience, and I know many other young people who I've worked with who say that their sense of gender has been very, very strong for as long as they can remember. Now, babies or infants learn about the concept of gender and start to develop categories related to gender from about age two. Now, this is a really young age, and it is one of the first categories that we start to develop. It is one of the most fundamental ways that we categorize people and start to develop our understanding of the social world. Now, of course, this will differ depending on the person. Maybe autistic people might have a uh, different processing time so that maybe uh, it happens later in life or it happens earlier in life or it happens in a different way. The gender conception might be more nuanced. There might be different sorts of categories. I just think that it's important to acknowledge this uh, and to recognize that because it's a mental model that we grow and develop over time, of course, it's going to be very, very diverse and we're all going to have different understandings about this. Now, although I love the genderbred person, I have just added a third variable down here, which is other genderness. And this is just to acknowledge that not everyone is going to identify with the concepts of womanhood or manhood, uh, womanness or manness. I think that it's important to recognize this, especially if there are people in our communities who are popping their hands up and saying, these aren't concepts that I want to live towards or maybe there's a certain combination of these traits that someone likes that they feel isn't actually captured by these two variables. So what is gender expression? Gender expression is how we communicate our gender identity to others. Now this can be intentional or unintentional, it can be a choice, um, and some things might just happen automatically. So again, I've added the third variable of other expression, just to acknowledge that people might not always identify with the concepts of femininity and masculinity. They might be kind of going off a different blueprint or a different set of values or a different set of characterizations. We communicate our gender through things like our clothing, our hairstyles, the name and pronouns that we use, and things like mannerisms, our body comportment, how we hold ourselves and how we conduct ourselves. It can also be related to things like our hobbies, our pursuits, our interests. Now, I've put the little stars next to the name and pronouns because I think that, and I hope that this will become clear over the rest of this presentation, is that name and pronouns are a really, really important way that we can express and have our gender expression and identities respected and acknowledged. 
this was the thing that came up time and time again, speaking with young people, that it's incredibly important and incredibly empowering and validating and respectful when their name and pronouns are used. This is particularly true for people who may choose a new name or may have different pronouns than the ones that they've been raised with. So what is sec? Now, this is another concept we've been taught is binary, uh, male or female. But it's also isn't very helpful. And what we're realizing now is that sex is more complex and more nuanced than this. It's a little part of a gender bred person that I've taken, and this is what we'll be going off. And as we can see, um, there are those two little sliding scales again. Now I haven't added a third one. I don't think that it's necessary for this. Um, but there is this concept of femaleness and maleness. And basically, sex is comprised of a few different things. It's our sexual organs, uh, it's our hormones, and it's also our chromosomes. Um, and so this is why sex isn't binary either. It's actually a bit of a combination of these things. And of course, when there are multiple variables at play, our sexual presentation, the way that we look, the way that our bodies are is going to vary from person to person. I think that it's really important to acknowledge this. So what is sexuality? So I guess this is another thing. I'm sure you're noticing a bit of a pattern now. Maybe traditionally we were thought to be only interested in people of the opposite sex or to someone who's a different gender, someone who's the opposite, ge opposite gender. This is also not the case, and sexuality is a lot more nuanced and complicated than that. As you can see here, I've got two little variables for this now, which is um, sexual attraction and romantic attraction. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about this too. As we can see, sexuality is actually as diverse as gender because it is a social construct. It is an idea and a model that has been developed by many different cultures over a long period of time. Uh, there are many different ways that it can be interpreted and embodied and expressed. So sexuality broadly is who we're attracted to, who we're interested in. And I've got here sexually and romantically because this talks about the split model of attraction. Uh, basically, it just means that we, might have uh, sexuality that varies between people who we just want to sleep with versus people who we're romantically have romantic feelings for. I think it's particularly important because many people in the autistic community do experience a different sense of sexuality uh, as our perceptions are different, as our ways of processing the world are different, so will be the ways that we process the social world and process relationships and how we connect with other people. So some people might have sexual attractions to one or more specific genders. And as we can see here, um, these ones have the women or feminine or female people versus men or masculine or male people. And I should have put third sliding scales for this as well, because some people, again, aren't connected to those constructs and don't identify with them. So maybe something else will be a better way of describing or labeling themselves. Labels that we do choose are also a form of expression. So this is why it is really important to listen to the labels and listen to the people, the, the words that people use to express their identities, um, because that in itself is a form of expression. Often growing up, we get handed a whole bunch of labels that we don't seem to get a choice over. Autistic people are very well acquainted with this, being given characterizations sometimes or often negative of who we are and what kind of a person we're like. So getting older and learning these labels and being able to advocate for ourselves and to say that this is what our labels are, to self-label is really important part of developing our identity, developing our sense of self and self-esteem. So just a bit of a plug to listen to the labels that people use and use them. Don't just disregard it because you haven't heard of it. Um, these things can be really important and they're really powerful. So finally, we're going to talk a little bit more now about combining these constructs together. What do autistic LGBTIQA plus young people want you to know? 
we spoke to over 70 autistic and or LGBTIQA plus young people across Australia. And we asked about their thoughts and opinions of what people and service providers could better do to support them. Things like what are the green flags and what are the red flags? What do you need? We got a pretty consistent response. Um, basically, people said that they want their name and pronouns to be used and respected. They want their judgment to be trusted. They want people to respect if they have a different processing time or if they have a different way of processing and interpreting information. And they want their sensory differences to be accommodated for. First up, respecting a person's name and pronoun. I cannot say this enough and I cannot stress enough the importance in doing this and practicing this. So using a person's name and pronouns is one of the easiest ways that their identity can be validated and felt and seen and heard. When I changed my name and when I started telling people what my new pronouns were, I felt really, really good when people would use them, even if someone would use them and then use the old ones or the incorrect ones and then correct themselves. It would feel incredibly good. It's basically, I think for me, I really wanted to explore this part of my identity. And I was really certain that this was how I felt and how I wanted to express myself. But of course, you need to try on these things first. There is always that chance that you might try on a pronoun or a name and actually realize that it doesn't fit. And then you can move on and try something else. That's okay. And that's a healthy form of identity exploration. There is absolutely no harm in trying out a new name or a new pronoun and seeing how it fits. I would encourage you to practice using this person's name and pronoun away from them. If you default to using their old name or their old pronoun, what some people might call a dead name, someone's name, their, um, new na like their old name once they've changed it, practice using this. Don't just default back to it and think that because they're not in the room, it doesn't really matter. You have a responsibility to start changing your own perceptions and challenging that so that when you're interacting with the person, Using their name and pronouns correctly is going to come naturally and comfortably. And that is going to help you to connect with the other person. And it's going to signify that you respect them and that you see and hear them. It is extremely meaningful and it's extremely important that we do this. And I think it is probably the most important thing. If you can only take away one thing from this training module, I would say it is to use someone's name and pronouns. There is nothing more jilting or disconcerting when someone after especially after a long period of time still hasn't gotten quite used to it we can tell when people practice and we can tell when people are uncomfortable what is really important is that people work through that and are moving forward and are growing their own conceptions as this person is growing theirs next up trust their judgment People understand themselves very well. We're stuck inside our heads 24 seven and we have a pretty good idea of ourselves. Being in adolescence is one of the most primary times that we can explore our identities. And it's a really important time for us to develop that sense of identity. It takes a whole lot of active exploration, both internal, listening to our thoughts, listening to our feelings, trying things on, seeing how we feel about it and ex external, which is expressing ourselves, pursuing different hobbies or interests or social groups or anything like that. So trust that somebody is on a journey and that they are doing the work to understand their identity. What happens if we have aspects of identity that we're trying to express or that we're trying to have acknowledged, if people shut them down or if people refuse to allow it or enable it or facilitate this kind of identity exploration, it thwarts us and it prevents us from being able to move through it. Basically, it can get you stuck and it can make it really hard to continue to grow. It's really important that we're able to explore these things so that we can either decide, yes, this does fit, this is who I am, and this is how I wanna carry myself going forward, or 
actually this doesn't fit quite right. And then that way you can move forward into a different direction. It's really important that we do facilitate this. And it's really important that we trust someone's judgment just because your conception of gender or sexuality doesn't fit with this other person's doesn't mean that it's not true. It's just different. Another really important thing that I need to stress is that there is a lot of negativity in the media, whether it's by news or whether it's by social media, whether it's by um, movies and TV shows, things like that. It actually takes a really big amount of effort to challenge these misconceptions and negative stereotypes and discrimination. So there's a lot of internal work, there's a lot of cognitive stuff that we have to work through in order to be able to express our identity. And by the time someone is expressing their sense of identity to you, they would have gone through a whole lot of processing and thinking and unpacking. So even though the idea is new for you, it's not going to be new for them. This is something that someone has been working through over a long period of time. And it's important that you trust their process and trust their judgment. Respect processing times and styles. So this is particularly relevant when we're working with autistic people. We have, as I've said before, different ways of processing information. Our sensory systems are different. The way that our brains connect up and process information are gonna be different too. This is gonna change how we see different ideas of the world, such as social things, different concepts, cultural expectations, things like that of that nature. Expectations can be stressful, especially for autistic people if A, you don't understand the expectation, or B, the expectation isn't something that comes naturally and it takes a whole lot of cognitive load and cognitive energy and concerted attention to be able to fulfill or try to fulfill this expectation. It can be really stressful and it's important that you're patient with people and accepting. And again, trust if people are expressing that something's stressful, that something's difficult for them. Next thing is to allow people the time and space to process in their own ways. Uh, before I worked at ICANN Network, I was a disability support worker and I worked with a lot of people who communicated in a whole bunch of different ways. A lot of it was non-speaking, it was through body language and gestures, gestures and things like that. My ability to connect with the clients changed completely the moment that I realized that I was not leaving a big enough gap in between my sentences and in between the things that I was saying and the amount of time that I waited for their response. Sometimes it feels awkward or unnaturally long that you're having to pause, but actually I realized that if I waited an extra five or 10 seconds, I was actually giving this person the chance to respond, and the chance to communicate back. When I realized this, I was really, disappointed that I hadn't learned about it earlier because it really did change the way that I was able to connect with other people and change the way that other people were able to connect with me. I think it's really important that you take this on board as well. And as, as, as you are working with young people, people who are autistic or have any other kinds of uh, differences, any other kinds of neurodiversity, uh, it's really important to recognize that some people might be able to present as though they're understanding what's going on and that they're processing things at an expected time, expected to a neurotypical. Um, but actually it's really important to check in and actually just remind yourself that this assumption of this standard or ideal way of processing information doesn't exist. You've just got to be conscious of that. Accommodate for sensory differences. So the best way that you can do this is to ask for them. Spoke, speak to a young person, maybe if you're in a, like if you're a service provider and you're working with young people in a mental health capacity or something like that, then on your forms, on your induction forms, or when you first meet someone, just ask, do you have any sensory needs? Do you have any sensory differences? Is there anything that we can do to help to accommodate for you? Often young people will be able to tell you, and that's great other young people might not know yet. They might not have had the chance to, but just be aware that there are a different bunch of different ways that we can process our sensory environment. And some sensory environments might lead to a lot of stress that a non-autistic person might not expect. 
So ensure that the waiting rooms are quiet and have not really bright lighting and maybe not a whole lot going on. Make sure that the environment itself is quiet. And I don't just mean that in a sound sense, I mean that visually quiet as well. We know that having too much information on the walls and lots of loud, vibrant things can be a bit conflicting and it can be difficult to process what's going on. But again, the best way to go about this is just to ask. Using respectful language. So this is another really important part. And basically um, what a lot of the young people that we spoke to said was that the words and the language that was being used was stuff that they found not comfortable and kind of demonstrated to them that the service providers weren't exactly um, up to date with some of the concepts and the ways that we might think about things. And this specifically relates to positive autistic identity and positive LGBTIQA plus identity. So start off, share your name and your pronoun. Now, I would encourage you to do this indiscriminately. Share your name and pronouns with whoever you meet. Don't assume that someone is gonna be LGBTIQA plus and then decide to share your pronouns in case they use pronouns that are different from what you're assuming. Share them every single time and it will just create a safe space and it will create an opportunity for this person to express their pronouns back comfortably with that extra level of assurance that you are open to this and you will be accepting of this. Don't assume someone's gender or sexuality. Even if it look like they're cisgender or they look like they're heterosexual, don't make these assumptions because you have no idea where someone's at in their journey. And as well, people's gender expression and their gender identity can differ vastly. We find especially autistic people as well who might have different ideas around gender identity and gender expression might present their gender identity in an atypical way. So perhaps someone uses he, him pronouns, their pronouns are he, him, but they have more of a feminine presentation. That's okay. Um, and luckily we didn't make any assumptions and we asked for this person's pronouns when we first met them. So it doesn't actually matter and we don't have to worry too much about that. Use gender neutral language. So for example, instead of calling people boys and girls, say everybody, say people, say folks, anything like that, just be aware of how often gendered language can come up. This is something that I've become hyper aware of since coming out as trans, because there is gendered language that is getting used in my day-to-day -day life. And it's pretty interesting. I think it's important that we do start to challenge this because you just don't know who's in the room and you want to make sure that we have a diversity of people in the room. Another really important point is to use reflective language. So listen to the young person, actively listen to what they're saying and the language that they use to describe themselves and to describe these ideas. If you're a GP or you're a psychologist and you're working with young people where it's relevant, ask them how they refer to their partner or ask them how they refer to a sibling who might be gender divergent. Ask them how they would like parts of their body to be labeled if it's relevant. If you make a mistake, if you use the wrong pronoun or the wrong name, it's totally okay. It's expected and it's understandable and people are patient with this. It's important that you acknowledge that you made the mistake, apologize and move on. This is just gonna reset that part of your brain so that subsequently, every time that you use it, it's gonna get a little bit easier to change that pattern that, go, that gets activated in your brain when you're talking to someone. Practice new names and pronouns away from this person to avoid making the mistake in front of them. If you're in allied health team, if you're working with a group of people, then practice using this name and pronouns with this group of people. It can be embarrassing and uncomfortable to go through this. And a lot of people aren't used to having to do it. So this is why it's especially important that we do start to make this a thing and do start to develop the habit of it. These efforts really do show that you care and it really shows that you are willing to make that connection. And it also signifies that you are a safe person and that you are also on your own journey. And it shows vulnerability too, which I think is important when developing these connections. Creating safe, inclusive spaces. So 
basically I've got a few points here and these are the main things that came up again and again and again in the surveys and in the youth consultation. Make sure you're using inclusive language by staff, on forms and on the shared resources. So if you're gonna share a brochure that a different organization has handed out, check over the language and see what they're using. If you're not sure what inclusive language is, there are a lot of resources online, but I would also encourage you to prioritize autistic or LGBTIQA plus organizations and resources that are created by these people, because that's gonna have some of the most inclusive language. Provide visual cues. A lot of people said that having posters or stickers or flags is a really good way to signify that a space is going to be accommodating and accepting and understanding. Of course, isn't this isn't the only thing that you can do. And often people can realize that the visual cue is at a, just a shallow level and there isn't that extra layer of understanding underneath it. This is why uh, it's really good to tie this stuff in with a bunch of other practices and make sure that you are constantly updating your understanding over these ideas. Make sure that your space is sensory friendly, have sensory tools or fidgets available and in the waiting rooms and in the sessions, and as well have autistic and or LGBTIQA plus employees. Having representative identities in your workplace as staff just signifies that you are actually progressive and you do actually recognize and celebrate these kinds of differences. It can be really empowering and really reassuring for a person who's accessing services to see themselves represented on the other side of the service provision. So where can you find more resources? I would really encourage you to check out the sheets that we have. Um, it's on our ICANN network uh, website, on our webpage, and they've got big lists of resources, resources for parents, professionals, and for young people. This is a great place to start, start, and it will be an introduction of where you can continue to go and continue to learn. Prioritize autistic and LGBTIQA plus voices. This is where you'll get diverse voices, and this is where you will get representation. We have incredible insights to our own experiences, and our communities are doing a really great job of coming together and really unpacking a lot of this stuff and really challenging a lot of the assumptions and a lot of the systemic discrimination that has prevented us from coming together in the past. So it's pretty much everything that I have to say for you all today. I really hope that you found this training module to be useful. Um, I know that's a lot of information, but I'm really hoping that you'll be able to take away the key tenets, which is basically just to listen to young people and what they say, trust their judgment and use the language that they use, use their names, use their pronouns, use the terms and labels that they use to describe themselves. And hopefully we're gonna do a really good job in helping to connect our communities up together more and helping to support ourselves to thrive and grow and develop our identities. So thank you and I'll talk to you soon.